Welcome to Bitch Talk, booze interviews straight from the heart of San Francisco. I'm Erin. That's Ange. Hi. That's Char. Hello. You can find us at bitchtalkpodcast.com where you can sign up for our monthly e-news. For behind the scenes videos and two minute clips of our interviews, head to our YouTube channel and subscribe. You can find us every other Thursday morning at 9.30 a.m. at bff.fm. And if you like what you hear, rate and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. For the love of God, do it. It really helps. Here we are at Sundance 2022 virtual edition. Uh, we are here with Bitch Talk Podcast and FilmsGoneWild.com. My name is John Wildman. I'm the editor in chief of FilmsGoneWild.com. And I have the uh, dynamic duo from Bitch Talk, Angela Tabora and Aaron Lim. They are here with me as well. And this, this is our first interview for Virtual Sundance. And we're going to talk about the short film, Long Line of Ladies. And we have the directors, Shandine Tome and Raika Zipachi. Um, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks, thanks for, for having, having us. us. Okay, now this is one where um, hopefully you two did rock, paper, scissors before this, because <laughs> I'm going to ask one of you to describe the film. Our audience has not seen the film as yet. So whoever wants to take this, tell us about Long Line of Ladies. Yeah, um, so uh, Long Line of Ladies is about a young girl, Ati Allen, and she is from the Yurok and Karadak tribes of Northern California, and she is in the film about to go through her coming-of-age ceremony called the Ihuk. That's short and sweet and perfect, and but there's a lot that goes into this. And um, um, I think, uh, Angela, did you want to start this one off? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I really appreciated... Uh, one, just learning about this, this ritual, but I appreciated uh, the, the film's emphasis on the leading up to the ceremony and, and not really the ceremony itself, um, because it, uh, there was so much beauty in just the, the community and the family coming together and, and realizing the, the beauty and, and the importance of, the, of a moment that, that we, especially you know, as Americans, have really been taught to mm. be sort of ashamed of and embarrassed by. So can you talk about your decision to really put the emphasis on the lead up to the ceremony and not the ceremony itself? I guess the emphasis comes from mostly, I guess, my own background. I'm Dene, so Navajo from the Southwest region of the United States. And I think there's always been an urge for filmmakers and all different types of artists or ethnographers to try and capture like what it means to be indigenous. And so I think the approach was definitely to try to get away from that um, ethnographic lens and try and find something that like had, um, I guess like what I know indigeneity to be, which is community and family and who you are in relation to each other. And I think that uh, is so present in this documentary. And I think it's like the emphasis of even just like ceremony, like ceremony is such an individual thing that um, especially this particular ceremony where Ati is like blindfolded and she's looking inward to herself. Um, we didn't want to disrupt that. And we didn't want to like try and capture what I think is like really difficult to capture in, in even in just a film because it's a, the family is going through like a lifetime of knowledge in order to be able to understand this. So I think we tried our best to capture the relationships that the family had with each other and their hopes for the future and all these different generations and how they come together to uplift a young woman. Rika, could you add to that a little bit in terms of um, like specific examples of the, the, how the two of you kind of mapped out, you know, when to ask to, to bring your cameras in conversations you had prior in setting up boundaries um, because it is it's it, it's it's such a sensitive uh, process you know that, that you know they're they're not it's not they're going through trying to revive something that's precious to them and you can tell um, which is wonderfully captured uh, you know uh, the, the delicacy of it with each generation and how they're approaching it and so how you approached the film that uh, I would love for you to talk about some specific examples that you made sure that you didn't overstep your bounds and that they felt safe with you. There were actually a lot of conversations kind of leading up to the to the shoot itself. Um, a lot of trust building with the subjects of the film, um, especially with um, Pim Allen, who is Ati Allen's mom. And she's 
she's um, heavily featured in the film and she's also just an incredible woman and um, someone who's been really instrumental in um, bringing back um, these ceremonies um, um, to the Kaduk people um, and really passing on a lot of that knowledge. So Pim, it was a lot of having conversations with her and with Almi, who's Ati's father um, beforehand. Um, and just for us really trying to, like we'll never understand the experience of going through the ceremony. And it's not, it's not ours to understand, but you know, as much as we could, we would have conversations with them and try to understand like, what is, you know, what is the intention behind this thing that happens or what is the meaning behind this? And what is it like, what are our boundaries? Like, what can we film and what can't we film? What do you feel comfortable sharing with the world? And then what is like, what is just for you guys to experience? Um, and, you know, for me personally, it was a really different filmmaking process than anything I've ever done before, um, especially in documentary filmmaking, because I think we're just so used to in docs, just kind of showing up with a camera and, um, and, and really just trying to capture as much as we possibly can. You know, I think it's like, it feels like a strength when you can come away and you have more footage than you initially anticipated capturing. But with this project, it was very much like trying to outline beforehand, Shandine and I trying to outline after having conversations with Pim, Pim seeing that outline being totally clued in. She's a producer on the film. Um, so it's very important to get her take on everything and get her, you know, kind of her sign off on everything so that she had a clear like idea of the film that we were really trying to make. So there were really no surprises in the editing process. Um, and we just found that to be really helpful in kind of building that trust. It was a long and very windy road, but um, I think, you know, we came out with a stronger film because of it. And more importantly, Pim and her family, the larger community are incredibly proud of this final product as they should be because it's, it's all about them and, and their story um, being revealed to the world. And that leads into the question I had. I love the balanced stories of the women and the men. And it just reflects back on our American westernized culture of, no, periods are only about women, but this was about the whole, the, the, the village or the community. Can you talk about shining the light on the father's story and having males from, from the uh, tribe, if you will, um, talk about this? Pim, the mom, basically, she puts it beautifully in a way that I think is so innate to indigenous peoples. Um, in my own culture, like there's a uh, hajo or like it, things in relation to each other or like creating a balance. And so I think there's, that is very much present in um, their own philosophies too. And their, their, their uh, stories, like the story of Dear Woman, which is about the ihuk really like heavily involves the men. And so like there's uncles and dads in that. And so like, there's, um, I think they, they as a community realize that like the center of this whole entire ceremony like initially is about Ati and is about her becoming a woman but it's also about like how can the whole community come together because you don't just make or like uh have like Ati just become a woman <laughs> it's like all the community has to come together in order to realize that and to like maintain that throughout her whole entire life and so like she'll grow up and she'll do the same for younger and then like maybe her cousins or her her younger brother Natez or her dad or someone will help contribute with that. One thing that you know when you're making um, a short documentary time literally is of the essence and you know and 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 you're really trying to you know give us a lot of information in a very short compact uh, manner. Um, can you talk about the editing process and, and maybe some challenges in making sure that you paid service to everything that you wanted to and, you know, and yet keep a momentum with that? I think like, you know, when the decision was made to like not capture the ceremony itself and actually have the film be about everything kind of leading up to, um, to the ceremony, and more, more about community and all the people around her. I think it became very clear to us that like, this is not a film that is about delivering information to audiences. You know, I think again, like in documentaries, like we're so used to just being spoon fed information all the time and in a very like clear and direct way, there's always a push to like 
you know, do voiceover and get it more, you know, get the information more clear. And it was kind of part of that, like wanting to respect the fact that this is their ceremony and that we're not going to overshare, you know, like there were things, there were more things that were captured, of course, than what ended up in this, this film. Cause I think what is the runtime, like 20 minutes. Um, so a lot of it wasn't shared, but it was also like, how can we sort of create the feeling and the texture, you know, the feeling that we felt being there. Um, it was more about, it was more about capturing like the energy of moments and the feeling of the, you know, everyone being around one another and being together as opposed to the audience needs to very clearly understand this very specific thing that takes place during the ceremony. Um, so it was a little bit of a balancing act, like how much do you share for people to be clued in and to really like most importantly to care and to be in invested, um, but but without oversharing, you know, without without getting too much into the the details or the weeds of things. So, you know, there it's it's a balance of that in the editing process and also how we captured a lot of the footage. I mean, you see a, a camera that is far away and it's generally wider and it's, you know, it's it's not about the details in the frame. Um, it's about kind of like standing back and feeling the energy of the room. Yeah, I, I love how in all of your answers is just this real emphasis on respect and boundaries and and knowing when to come in and um, and really finding the right subject. And, and, and so I'm curious to find out if you heard about the e-hook and you knew you wanted to cover it, you were just kind of scouting for the right family or the right girl to cover, or did you always know that it was going to be Ati? Yeah, so the process kind of, um, it, it goes like back many years um, to a film that I made a documentary called Period End of Sentence. Um, and I made it alongside the PAD Project, um, which I'm, I'm now a part of as well. It's a nonprofit organization and their mission is to sort of eradicate the stigma around menstruation worldwide through education. Um, and the PAD Project was behind this film as well. Um, and so after period end of sentence, which was a film that kind of, it really established um, the shame and the stigma around menstruation, specifically in Northern India. But after that film, there's sort of a, like we were, we were trying to figure out a way that we could sort of do the opposite. Like how can you find a story or a community of people that actually um, you know, for a long time have actually like had positive thoughts about menstruation and like really supported their girls during this time. Um, you know, instead of like just kind of jumping on the bandwagon of the menstrual hygiene movement that really was sort of kickstarted like a handful of years ago. Um, and so, so from that, we sort of started doing research and um, realize that, you know, there are a lot of native tribes that have um, coming of age ceremonies for young girls when they first menstruate. And um, they're really sort of positive experiences. And we, we um, then found, uh, I think it was like a blog post on the Ihuk ceremony that actually Pim had, uh, had a part in. It was about her older daughter, Ty's ceremony. Um, and then we kind of tracked him down on Facebook and did it the, you know, the social media way, but the old fashioned way, um, <laughs> the old, yeah, or the new fashion way rather, <laughs> but she was very excited and responsive and, you know, immediately, you know, responded to the request to connect with us. And, um, and then, you know, the rest is history. Well, I'll tell you what, you know, uh, considering um, that you're following up on an Academy Award winner and Sean Dean, that, you know, that, that you're continuing your, your Sundance streak going with this film. Uh, this one is, is just a wonderful follow up and uh, uh, really lovely. Again, the film is Long Line of Ladies. We've been talking to the directors, Sean Dean Tome and Raiko Sapachi. It's been wonderful talking to you about the film. Thank you all for the time. Thank you. If you like what you hear, rate and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. For more information about us, you can head to bitchtalkpodcast.com. This podcast is created, hosted, and executive produced by Aaron Lim. My co-host is Angela Tabora, a.k.a. Captain Party. The show's edited by producer Shar. We're powered by GoTo Productions.
This podcast is a proud member of the BFF.FM podcast network. Learn more at podcast.bff.fm. BFF.FM, best frequencies forever.